Hello, hello for a special edition of Open EGU MoMA PS1 special workshop with Maya Mumine. We're so excited to have you, Maya. Everyone, just take a seat, take your pens and papers um, to get ready to have this wonderful lesson or class or lecture or workshop, all of the above, uh, around decolonizing design. And of course, we will dive deeper into that, why we chose that specific title, of course, and the perspectives in which Maya is going to be uh, talking from. This is such an amazing class, amazing. We're about, we're close to 300 students already in this uh, wonderful lunch break. I'm hoping everyone can <clears throat> use the chat to tell us a little bit where you're coming from. And if you are on occupied territory, uh, I'm here uh, we're calling from unceded territory of the Lenape Hoking people. And I am uh, joining Maya and Jenny uh, here. Oops, sorry, <laughs> one second. Um, and we also have Antonio, who Jenny and Antonio are going to be our American Sign Language interpreters. Big shout out and thank you to Nick from the Slow Factory team for organizing. Big shout out to Krista for helping designing these classes, Paloma, Nicole, and Zoya for supporting Open EGU. Uh, welcoming Maya Mumne, my dear peer from Lebanon, who is now in Montreal. Maya, uh, I'm not going to read your bio because that's not what we do here at Stove Factory. So in your words, introduce yourself and then I will shut my camera off and come back to support you on Q&A. Thank you, Celine. Um, hi, everyone. My name is uh, Maya and um, I co-founded uh, Studio Safar about 10 years ago with my business partner, Hatem Imam. Um, Studio Safar is a design agency and a publisher that's based in Beirut and now in Montreal. Um, the studio is mostly concerned with notions of communication across cultural and linguistic barriers. Um, projects span different media and design frameworks such as communication strategies, publications, visual identities, um, exhibitions, uh, set designs and websites. Um, most of the work services the extended cultural sector um, and is engaged with social and political discourse. And uh, what you see here is a magazine that the studio publishes called Safar. It's bilingual, so it's in Arabic and in English. Um, and it's about design and visual culture in the region. Um, the magazine answers to the lack of critical writing um, on design in the global south, and it works towards acknowledging designers as active agents of cultural production. And the studio is also expanding into publishing books on design in the region. Um, I'm starting off with a picture from a foreword of one of our past issues that was published um, during the pandemic, um, the uprising in Lebanon, and shortly before the explosion of August 4th, 2020. Um, pandemics, policy, and economics try to dampen the fact that we have a voice, and yes, it will be heard. Um, and I also just want to mention that the research findings and thoughts in this presentation are a collaboration between Hatem Imam uh, and myself. The writings are taken from conversations we've had and interviews um, we've conducted together. Um, welcome to Slow Factory's course on decolonizing design. Um, this is not a hands-on workshop. It's going to be a talk with prompts throughout, um, asking ourselves questions on how we consume colonized design and the things that we can do um, to not be part of that conversation or, or accept that conversation. Um, a lot of the images used are collected throughout the years, so they're not sourced for this presentation. But if I understand correctly, this presentation is going to be made accessible to all the attendees. Um, and before they are, before it is made accessible, the images will all be sourced, so you can track them. You can contact the people behind the images if you're curious. Um, so on and so forth. So um, design is inherently political. It shapes our cities, our homes, bodies, and our minds. It curates, connects, arranges, and defines. 
And perhaps above all, it carries the power to shape our responses to challenges big and small, local and global, short and long term. This class comes from an urge to decolonize visual culture from decades of European and American hegemony. And um, as Studio Safar, um, we are in no way claiming to, you know, have gotten to this, you know, part of decolonizing visual culture. I don't even know if that's even something that's possible to get to. Um, but the thing that's that's worth noting for me personally is that um, what we try to do is take a step back and play a little tug of war between work that we've been, or design or visual culture that we've been conditioned to um, um, uh, kind of consume um, and, and reference as, as practitioners. Um, and when we take a step back and say, wait, is this, does this really reflect representation or is this, you know, um, something that I've been given or told? And if, if, and if, if you're a designer and you know um, what the font is that, that we're being, that's being used in this deck, or you know um, what, the, what the calendar is that's hanging behind me, um, you'll probably flag this conversation as a hypocrisy. But it's also important to note here that part of this process or part of this conversation is in acknowledging and allowing these things to happen. We, we, we did grow up with this, with this knowledge and with this conditioning, um, and it does make a big part of the way that we consume and the way that we produce today. Um, the important thing is to um, kind of train ourselves to take a step back and say, where does this come from? And what can I do to look for the alternative narrative or the alternative conversation on this? Um, and we are going to go through five sections today. So the first one is um, a brief introduction onto decolonizing design, why we're talking about this today. Um, the second part is going to cover Arabic typography and Arabic calligraphy and the mini rivalry that exists between these two. The third part is going to be stories for children. So I'm not going to go into the actual stories. Um, in the children's books, but I'm going to talk about um, a movement that happened in the 1970s in the Arab region uh, that played a big, big, big part in um, decolonizing the future. The fourth section is on academia. So um, what publications or what content exists out there um, and is made accessible to us to consume that plays an alternative or that tells an alternative narrative from um, European and American history. Um, and the fifth one is more of a conversation um, together to discuss um, people, initiatives, or collectives that are using the tools and the resources that, um, that, that we know and use today to change the narrative on design and visual culture and the way it's being consumed. So, why do we, uh, why, call, why decolonize design? Um, American and European design history and thinking have definitely shaped our understanding of the field of design. And while we may often mistake this for globalization, um, uh, a more accurate term for this is actually colonialism. Um, and we see this in, you know, uh, the books that we grew up learning about in design school, um, the fonts that we were told are the right fonts to use, the grid systems that have been imposed on us as you know, uh, uh, the way or the only way to lay out publications and letterheads and business cards and um, um, communication materials like these. Um, colonialism starts with language and it, uh, sorry, this is stuck. Colonialism starts with language um, and it extends to all fields of cultural production from fashion to architecture and most certainly graphic design. Um, and before we get into the meat of the content, I'd also like to start with a few words and their definitions. And I'd like us to have these words in the back of our minds as we go through the different sections. Um, so the first word is fetish. Um, a fetish is an excessive or an irrational commitment, devotion to, or obsession with something. Um, think about the use of um, Japanese culture in um, worldwide pop culture today, um, or, or the influence of um, Yakuza tattoos around the world and the obsession with that today, uh, or even Arabic tattoos. I mean, the list goes on and on and on, but I've included one mini example for you guys to like, you know, just kind of put the word and the image together. The second word is to romanticize and to romanticize is to deal with or describe 
in an idealized or unrealistic fashion. So to make something seem better or more appealing than it really is. Um, and the example I'm gonna give here is, you know, uh, our obsession or our, fantas or, or our fascination with, uh, with the 50s and the, advertising, the advertisement that came out in the 50s or um, uh, the way women and men were represented back then. Although we know that this, this era was rife with discrimination against race uh, and women, um, the next word is exoticize and to exoticize is to portray someone or something unfamiliar as exotic or unusual. So to romanticize or to glamorize it. Um, and here, you know, I'm just going to go ahead and ask why do American supermarkets still include ethnic food aisles? Um, and the fourth and final word is pastiche. Uh, pastiche is an artistic work in a style that imitates that of another work, an artist, or a period. Um, a prime example here is the Latin font that's used in many uh, fast food Chinese restaurants. Um, the, the, the next section talks about um, Arabic typography and Arabic calligraphy. Um, and calligraphy, and I mean, Calligra Arabic calligraphy was used for a much, much longer period in, in, in printed matter than, than Latin calligraphy uh, was. Um, so, so Arabic fonts were introduced to us at a much later stage than Latin fonts were introduced to us. Um, and a lot of that was also a big part of the introduction of, of Arabic uh, fonts was uh, letter sets too. I mean, for those who don't know what letter sets are, they are what we used to use uh, before computers um, generated the kind of design work that it does today. Um, so they're, they're sheets with repetitions of letters and they're all like kind of um, done with a, in a certain font. And you kind of put the paper or this sheet on top of your poster or your whatever you wanna lay out and you scratch out the letter individually and it kind of transfers onto the paper. Um, and that's when you create like an original artwork, you scan it and then you reproduce it as a book or as a poster. Um, and magazines and uh, uh, newspapers or any form of publication in the region, in the Arab region, were all uh, handwritten actually, whether they were uh, written in calligraphy um, or they were hand lettered. And, Maybe here I can talk a little bit about the distinction between uh, what calligraphy is and what hand lettering is. So calligraphy is um, the Arabic letter form drawn with a brush. Um, and the brush is not a, necessarily just a paintbrush. It's a, usually a calligraphy pen. Um, and so it's, you know, it starts, you know, you start with one letter and then you just kind of continue with one hand. Um, lettering is when you literally draw the letter forms by hand and that can be on a gridded on gridded paper or it can be free form but those are usually drawn instead of written with one um with one brush um and so a lot of our publications were completely done by hand all of the text was written by hand whether it was in magazines or it was in newspapers this is completely written by hand and not typeset um on a computer um and m most recently, I mean, when, when, when design, when graphic design was being um, uh, given its, its own space in the Arab region, so universities were, were now including graphic design as part of their uh, curriculums, um, and it, was, it became a major, and graphic designers now had a name, graphic designer. Before that, they were either calligraphers or painters or whatever, and when this, when this um, kind of became a job, like a, like a practice, um, we started looking into, um, designing fonts in Arabic. And to design fonts in Arabic, I mean, there are, there are, there are so many beautiful Arabic fonts that we use today. Um, but the thing here, the tug of war that I was talking about earlier is when we take a step back and ask ourselves, where do these fonts, where, where does the base of the creation of these fonts come from? Um, a, a, a big thing that happened um, when we started creating contemporary Arabic fonts for use is that we started um, using the know-how of creating Latin fonts to Arabic. Um, and so we'd apply that same kind of logic that we would to um, designing um, Helvetica to Arabic. Um, and the problem with that is that Arabic fonts started taking on the form of Latin fonts. Um, and you can see that vividly in the layout. So they'd have the same um, leading and the same kind of kerning. And if you squint your eyes looking at this, um, you kind of, you almost can't squint your eyes enough that you can't tell the languages apart. You actually can't tell them apart anymore because they are meant to have the same letter forms, but communicate in different languages. 
And I mean, of course, while most of these fonts are beautiful and we all use them, it's also just worth noting that um, at some point we all ask ourselves, why are we basing Arabic font creation on the way that we create fonts in English instead of using um, the history of how Arabic fonts was, was consumed or was produced, um, which was calligraphy based. And there was, you know, a period of, of, of connecting English to Arabic. And so, you know, our layouts seemed seamless like this. They looked seamless. And so it was so easy to design a bilingual poster or a bilingual book because the, the Latin and the Arabic occupy the exact same space. One wasn't screaming louder than the other. But the problem with this was that the English, the Arabic was almost always following the logic of the English. Um, and you can see here, even in the letter forms of the Arabic, it's all monospaced. Whereas when we would, you know, when, 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 when Arabic um, is written in calligraphy or even hand lettered, there's a thick and thin that plays a big part here um, that, that we stopped seeing at some point. Um, and this resulted in, you know, an obsession with creating bilingual logos that almost looked identical, um, the English and the Arabic counterparts, I mean. So whether the English existed first and then we created the Arabic or we were creating them both at the same time, there was a fixation with making sure that the English and the Arabic were exactly identical and occupied the same amount of space, even though this brand was, you know, um, um, being created for a, a client in the region and whatnot. Um, and if we just take a step back and we look at how Arabic letter forms were created um, before the introduction of contemporary Arabic fonts, um, we'll see that, you know, it is so varied and it comes from a place of um, a lot of experimentation, a lot of thick and thins. And I'm not, I'm no expert on typography and certainly not in Arabic typography, but this is a question that we ask ourselves a lot in our practice um, and at Safar, what we do is we um, either use or either collaborate with calligraphers um, or we um, use calligraphy as a base um, to, to, to derail from and then create, you know, a, a letter form or a shape in which uh, we're happy with and doesn't necessarily copy uh, whatever exists in English. And if you've ever been to Dubai or the Gulf, you'll notice that all of the shops in the malls um, exist in their English logos, but they have their Arabic counterparts. So it's bylaw there that if you were to open Tiffany & Co, you had to have an Arabic version of Tiffany & Co. And so what we did is we exactly replicated Tiffany & Co in Arabic. And the way that we did that is we used the letter forms um, from the Latin logo to create the Arabic. And so you'll see serifs used on the Arabic here and although, you know, and the and is replaced here, although this doesn't exist at all in the history of Arabic typography. Um, and and to, to take a font that's less, you know, uh, classical, um, Messi Muduti, for example, was, you know, exactly, we replicated that kind of like Latin hand-free drawing or signature like to create it in Arabic. Um, and I'm gonna look, I'm gonna just take you back here to take, to tell you that, um, Calligraphy wasn't, I mean, if we look at this, it's quite traditional in its form. And, and the reason why we, we became obsessed or fixated with the idea of moving into um, a, a contemporary uh, Arabic typography or borrowing from the, the way that we design Latin fonts is because they look, these look very traditional. And, and, and traditional means that these were used in, uh, since the Ottoman uh, Empire. Um, and these are used in um, religious texts or textbooks. Um, and a big part of colonialization is also to make us move away from this, right? To make us move away from um, the influences of Ottoman art or, or, or Quranic art um, and, and miniatures and all of that stuff. Um, and, I'm, and I'm including these slides to also show you that it's not all, it doesn't all look like that. The past Arabic script doesn't all look like that. A lot of it is very experimental actually. Um, but to understand what the original how the original letter form um, is drawn or written um, means that we can use it as a base and derive from there to create um, very experimental hand lettering in Arabic. But as long as we know what the base is, right, we can move away from that. And then we can start using uh, visual cues to lay it out on uh, our page or on our headers. Um, and you'll see here a, a very interesting detail is an old magazines um, not the calligraphers, but the Arabic um, uh, type letterers used to sign their work 
even though this was the headline of an article in an Arabic magazine, for example. Um, and there are, you know, so many different forms that this took shape in. Um, and colors. I mean, here you can also see that the letter forms are quite mono um, in, in, in width, but um, it also comes stems from a certain convention or a certain place. Um, stories for children. This is a, a, a section that is very dear to my heart. Um, and it's important to me because um, we'll get to that in academia, but just very briefly right now, um, I went to the American University of Beirut. And so all of the textbooks that I studied off of or all of the curriculums that were presented to me were all based off of um, American textbooks um, and a lot of European ones as well. So Swiss, the, the, the Swiss graphic design and the Bauhaus movement and all of that stuff. Um, and at some point, a teacher in uh, my university introduced us to um, publications that were um, publications for children that were um, printed and written and illustrated within the region. And I wasn't familiar with this. I had no idea that this existed. As far as I'm concerned, um, these were the publications that existed for children. And this is, for those that don't read Arabic, this says Oliver Twist. So this is a story about Oliver Twist. Um, and what used to happen at the time in the region was we would import these foreign books um, publishing houses within the region used to take them, translate them to Arabic, and then republish them in their Arabic form. And so these were the books that children were consuming. Um, decolonizing the future um, starts with children. And it starts, and, and, and at that time, it started with children's books. Um, and it used children's books as a medium to change the narrative on representation and storytelling. Um, in the 1970s, I think in the 19, I think in 1974, um, something revolutionary happened. And um, it was a publishing house that um, opens called Dar al-Fata al-Arabi. So it's, um, the literal translation to that is a house of the Arab child or the Arabic child. They started a publishing house where they um, commissioned Arab writers and Arab illustrators to um, write and illustrate stories in Arabic to Arab children using Arab representation, um, whether it's representation in its visual form or in its um, linguistic form. So stories that we could relate to or children in the Arab region could relate to. Um, and I'm not gonna get into the politics of what was happening at that time, but if you look into um, what was happening politically at that time in the Arab region, um, you'll understand why that was important, why that representation was important and things like Oliver Twist was not or Robin Hood. Um, and a lot of the things that, that came about were um, um, publications such as this one called al Fabaiyat Palestine, so the, the Palestinian alphabet. Um, so it's, a, it's, a, it's, an, it's an alphabet book or an alphabet poster, um, um, but, it's, but it's called the Palestinian alphabet. Um, and it's called the, alpha, the, the Palestinian alphabet because it used words to accompany the letters in the alphabet that were representative of the time, the era, and the audience. Um, and here we'll look at this. So this is the poster format of this publication. And here I just want to stop here to take a, to take a look at um, what was being used as a representation for these words and, and why they were there. Um, and so things that were, that were important here were uh, um, O for orange, um, and orange was important because um, uh, Palestine is the land of citrus. It produces a lot of citrus. Um, and so for, for, for O, we pick orange, the fruit, the national fruit. Um, F for figs, so figs are, are a very big part of, 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 our, of our food culture as well. Um, uh, R for robe, and the robe being depicted here is a Palestinian robe with traditional um, Palestinian embroidery. Um, R for roots as well, um, because at the time we were talking about Palestine and our roots um, and home and, and the Nakba. Um, and here we have an illustration of uh, the Hatta, the Palestinian Hatta, which is the scarf that's, that represents, you know, um, Palestine and Jordan um, that's being used by lots of fashion brands around the world and completely lost its meaning um, in translation. Um, H for home, and home is important because home was taken away at that time. Um, uh, B for bullet, um, O for olive, 
um, S for sword, um, uh, C for cactus, uh, B for braid, because braids were something that, that was quite, you know, um, common. it was common, you know, that that's what girls hair looked like at the time. It was, you grow your hair long, you don't cut your hair. Um, and we braid our hair, our, our hair a lot. Uh, D for drum, because, you know, a lot of our music is based on percussion. Um, um, e for envelope, um, with the notion of, 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 um, of uh, I'm, I'm blanking on the word now, but I'll get back to it. Um, F for flag. Um, B for bomb, uh, Q for, or B for book, but what's being represented here is a, is a Quran, um, A for almonds, um, a G for gun, uh, P for palm tree, um, T for target, um, uh, and for nation, and this is the map of Palestine, so on and so forth. So I'm, I just, you know, want to stop here just to talk about how important representation is and how important it was that this initiative or this this groundbreaking work started happening in the 70s um, um, and and in Lebanon at the time for example a lot of children there were a lot of um, uh, refugee children um, and of course we're not going to be talking about the etiquettes of dining on the table to refugee children we're going to be talking about um, content that is relevant to them um, to, to, to the, the, the realistic situation in, in, in the region and um, and, and, and give them some sort of validation and some sort of representation. This is a publication, um, I'm not gonna go into the spread of it, but you can find it online, it's called The Home. I'll also source this um, once this presentation is made accessible so you can, you can find the scans of this online. But this is a book called Home and this book was translated into many different languages and um, toured the world. Um, and this is this is a book by Mahidin al Abad, who was one of the most prominent figures of this uh, publishing house for children, and who was behind all of this work that was done. Um, and the and and home is about the home of um, Palestinian uh, child that was taken away from him. And the book basically um, to explain this notion of of home to a child, the book goes through the homes of um, different animals. So what's what is the home of a hen called? What is the home of a horse called? What is the home of a fish called? Um, what is the home of a Palestinian boy and why was it taken away from them and how do we retrieve that? It's a beautiful book and it was translated into many different languages and toward the world um, and it's a collectible item today. Other books uh, offered representation um, that was much more in line with the realistic or the, re the reality of the situation back then that is of course deemed extremely con con uh, um, controversial today. So this book is called The Gun and the illustration on the cover is obviously The Gun. Um, but it's important to note that at the time, um, the, 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 the narrative or the conversation um, uh, and the reality were, were really uh, contradicting, very, very, very contradictory. Um, and, and, and though also, um, uh, you know, very, un, you know, could, could pass as unpopular content at the time, very important that this existed. Um, other forms of representation comes in the way that people were illustrated in these books for children and the way that the, la the, the, the way the landscapes were also portrayed. Um, and so you see a field here and you see palm trees and um, there, there's a very particular way in which um, the characters clothes were drawn and the way their eyes were illustrated. Um, and the color of their hair. And so here again, we see the reference of the braid in the girls um, and in the ornamentation and the embroidery that exists in um, our, 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 our folkloric clothes. Um, and that existed a lot in, 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 in the illustrations for children as well. And here we have the orange tree yet again. Um, and then we have the eyelashes that are drawn and the skin color, most importantly, the skin color. The books stop portraying us as white people. Um, Oops. And finally, um, I also want to mention that a, a lot, um, a lot that was done in in these books was uh, skewed perspectives. And skewed perspectives um, is what is how Ottoman miniatures used to be drawn. Perspective was never they never came from a point perspective. It was always skewed. Um, and so that whoops that was also used. My mouse keeps derailing. That was also used in the way that we drew for children at the time as well. Um, in addition to uh, the ornamentation that we excessively start using in different places like here um, and on the grass here or on the fields here and then on the leaves here, that all comes from um, the miniature paintings that we grew up, um, that we grew up with. Um, 
the next section is about academia and the existence of, you know, or the documentation of this material in, in, in academia. Um, art historians have paid scant attention all over the world to printed matter and graphic design. Um, so when we, when we learn about um, the history of a civil war, we learn about the history of a civil war from the historian's perspective, but it's never been told from the visual aspect of a civil war, which makes up, you know, a very big part of, um, of, 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 of the history of the war itself. We know about war propaganda, right? But um, very rarely is, is, is the history of, of that civil war told to the future um, through that aspect. Um, and specifically in the Arab region, at some point we had close to no documentation of our own visual culture. Um, and when we talk about the hegemony and heavy influence of American and European design history and thinking, we see this very vividly in academia. So um, in the works given and in the works produced by students. Um, also in the seventies, we came across um, a series of books called Nazar. So this is one edition, oops. Um, this is one edition and this is another one. Um, I think three or four of these were printed at the time. So it was a periodical um, and um, Nazar means vision. And it was a periodical about visual culture, um, about all of the visual material produced and made accessible to us at the time. Um, what it meant, did it resemble us? How did we change that? Whether it was skin color or it was the way that superheroes were drawn, you know, superheroes are usually um, drawn going from one direction to another. Um, whether that followed the script in Arabic, because in Arabic, you don't write from left to right, you write from, um, sorry, yeah, you write from right to left. So like in Japanese, so we read, we read this from here to here. Um, and so that also made Mahidin al Abad, the person behind this periodical, ask these questions as well. Um, and I also just want to mention that um, this influence of American and design um, history and thinking on us is not all a bad thing. I'm, I'm, I'm in no way claiming that we need to completely abolish that. that this, is, this is not realistic. Um, again, to bring back the topic of the font chosen in this presentation or the calendar hanging behind me. It's very important to acknowledge and accept um, that, that this makes up a very big part of our understanding of design and the way that we produce design today. And I am very inspired by American and European design. But again, it's just a matter of um, looking at the alternative um, um, story being told here or, or the alternative way of doing things here. Um, and again, this is a double-edged sword. On one hand, there is something exciting um, and new about the assemblage of influences and references. But on the other hand, there is definitely a partial erasure of local conventions and representation. Um, and owing to the absence of local institutional archives that specialize in prints and or visual and material culture, we rely on the personal collections and archives of our friends and colleagues. Um, a lot of personal initiatives have um, been stemming out in the, in the last 10 years to personally take this on to document this um, you know, visual material and make it accessible to the public. Uh, this is just one example and it's called the Ahala Studio that's based in Dubai at the moment. But for the very first time in 2020, an academic book on the history of graphic design um, was published in Cairo by Haytham Nawar and Bahia Shab. And this book is literally called The History of Arab Graphic Design. Um, and this book covers the um, timeline of graphic design before it was graphic design. So um, before graphic design was, was given a name in the Arab region, it was painters and calligraphers that would design posters and books and, you know, uh, campaigns and that sort of thing. And so they cover that timeline from back when to today. And they cover, you know, there, there's a lot of um, um, studies on current graphic designers and their works and the work being produced. And um, it's, it's a great book and I recommend it. But there are also a lot of other books that are being published at the moment. And these are more, these slides are more resources for you. They're, they're not wholesome. They're just, you know, um, what I wanted to show today. But these are also, if you're interested to take screenshots and, and read these books, these are really very important publications that exist today. This one is called Off the Wall by Zena Maasri. And it's um, basically a history of the Lebanese civil war told from basically the, 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 the visual realm of it, the visual aspect of it. Um, and that is the political posters that um, occupied the entire city. Um, another series of books is published by uh, 
a publishing house called Hut Books, um, and they go, you know, uh, artist by artist or designer by designer, um, and they do, you know, it's quite, it's quite, a, they're quite thorough books on designers at the time and artists at the time. Um, and again, these did not exist before, and it's really amazing that you know um, this resource is, is ever growing today. Um, Another great book that was recently published, I think it was, it came out last year, is also by Zanama Asri. It's called Cosmopolitan Radicalism. Um, and it talks about Beirut's global 60s um, um, from the visual realm. So the visual politics of Beirut's global 60s. Um, and I think it's really brilliant that designers can play that role in not just being designers that are hired to produce campaigns um, or cigarettes or sneakers or all the stuff you can become you can become a designer uh, that turns into a historian and Zinana Asri is an example of that she's a historian now um, the final section is called changing the narrative and here I'd like to invite you um, at the end to um, help me challenge the narrative or help me challenge, you know, what I've been talking about today and ask questions. Um, design and politics go hand in hand. As designers, we've been trained and encouraged to apply our skills and imagination to sell in essential things at best. Um, like cigarettes and sneakers, credit cards, recreational vehicles. This is taken from the first things first manifesto. Um, but we've been, we've never been encouraged. Um, actually, we've been discouraged from uh, speaking up or tackling politics and mental health and environmental and social crises. And the list goes on and on and on. Um, and here, I'd just like to take a moment to talk about um, or to show you a few initiatives that are changing that narrative on on design, on colonized design as we know it. Um, and carving out that space for um, typography that is taking on a new form. Um, this one is called Type Platform. Um, again, I will link these in the presentation um, and, and you can follow them. Um, there is also Type Lab based in Cairo that is a research space on the developments and dissemination of Arabic letters. Um, this is another initiative um, that I that is very dear to my heart um, that was done by two graphic designers called Farah Fayyad and Siwar Ereitim. During the um, Lebanese uprising in 2019, at the end of 2019, they um, moved their silkscreen machine to the streets where the protests were happening and designed these really beautiful <clears throat> prints for people to bring in their own t-shirts or tote bags or posters or anything um, that communicated chants that were being chanted on the streets or in popular songs at the time. Um, and people would just gather and have them printed. And so we had this, we had this moving campaign all over the city um, that was perpetuating for the fall of, of, of the regime in, in Lebanon. Um, and then there is a platform called uh, Type Arabe, which um, is, and I'm gonna read what it says, the uncivilized experimental platform dedicated to the preservation and evolution of Arabic typography and type design. And this was based in Qatar. Um, and, you know, I mean, the list goes on and on and on women in typography that's not necessarily um, based in the region, but it's it, it has an emphasis on celebrating women and non binary people. Um, lots of initiatives on Arabic type and the, the example I'd like to end with is a radio station um, that stemmed from Palestine called Radio Al Hara. And although this isn't um, a design project, it's a radio station, it's about music. Um, a big part of Radio Al Hara's you know, dissemination across the world and the success and the, and the, 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 the reach it's made is um, I think due in part to its visual communication. Um, and this is done in collaboration with a, a, a Jordanian type studio called uh, Turbo. Um, so to go back to the, the question that, um, or, or, or the statement I made earlier, which is uh, we're not, I'm not claiming as Safar to be decolonizing design in any form or way. Um, we do, we do, we do try our best to ask ourselves these questions and apply um, this notion of taking a step back and, and playing a little tug of war game with what we've been taught and what we're learning on our own um, and, and the history that we are, you know, kind of scratching out to find and, and, and make, make public and accessible to, to everyone. And how do we take that? What can we do with that as designers? Like what I'm a designer, right? I get commissioned to design um, 
uh, a clothing brand, the identity of a clothing brand, um, or the posters for a music festival. Um, and I often get asked this question, what do you do? Like, what do you, what exactly do you do? And because my title is a graphic designer, but you know, what, what I publish online isn't, you know, the logo I've done for this client or the poster I've done for that client. It's a lot more than that. Um, and, and this is, you know, one thing that I think kind of gives the studio um, the energy to continue doing what it does and is self-initiated work. Um, and of course, as designer, self-initiated work is something that takes up a lot of time and you don't often get paid for that. Um, but that's when, you know, we find a balance between taking on commissioned work to be able to produce self-initiated work that we um, most of the time fund ourselves. Um, one of the things that we do is, again, Safar. And in Safar, the reason why uh, we put this out is to discuss the effect or the impact of design um, on visual culture, on the visual realm, on cultural production. So um, how does the design of passports, for example, passports is a big thing for us in the Arab region because our passports usually can't take us all over the world. And if you have a Lebanese passport, you can barely go anywhere with it without having to apply for a visa. And visa processes are very expensive. And a lot of times you get rejected for a visa depending on you know your history and your name and all of that. Um, so one of the things that we do at Safar is, for example, talk about things that are like content that's accessible or questions that are accessible um, to people who are not designers. Like, um, do you know what the design of your passport is saying exactly? Um, so we, you know, tackle the topic of um, a hierarchy in, in, in education systems or um, passport designs and how the passport of the design actually um, influences or informs the way that the passport gives you access to different ports around the world. Um, and it, that, that's really important, really, really important for us, because if we were to continue having this conversation with people that are just designers, then this conversation is not going anywhere. It's just staying within the circle of designers. Um, but what we're trying to do, I don't know if this is successful yet, but what we're trying to do is um, show you that design is um, accessible or, 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 or everything that, that, that we know and, and talk about is informed by design and it stems from there. Um, and to um, end the talk and start the conversation and the questions and answers, I'd like to just ask if I can challenge you. Um, one of our missions is to shift the attention of the design narrative from its fixation on the global north and to look inwards and backward at history. Um, and if we were to agree to recognize design as an active agent in cultural production, then how can we use the tools we have as designers to present more useful, lasting, and democratic forms of communication today. What can we do um, to shift that conversation, both with ourselves and with the general public, whether you are a, teachers or, a teacher, um, or you are a consumer, or you are a producer, a designer? Thank you. Thank you so much, Maya. I hope you can see the comments in the chat <laughs> as uh, we are all pondering on this uh, challenge that you've left us with. If you want to take a look at the chat, there's been a lot of great comments. And then we're going to start with the Q&A for those of you who want to ask questions. I've seen some questions happening in the chat. If you could please leave them in the Q&A uh, box just at the bottom here, that would be really good. And for those of you who um, are working on this and would like to share your thoughts as well, I would love for you to use the Q&A. That way it would be great to just, it's an easier way to, to read your, your comments. And as you all ponder and think about more ethical ways, more, um, what was the question again uh, that you had put for us, Maya? If you can just read it and we can type it in the chat. Of course, um, the question is, how can we use the tools we have as designers to present more useful, lasting and democratic forms of communication? So we're designers, we actually have a very big impact in the way a business, um, a business sales go up, up or go down. How do we use these tools to um, change the conversation on communication and create more useful and lasting forms of it? Mm -hmm, absolutely. And that's something. Oh, thank you, Krista. Krista did a better job than I did <laughs> putting that question in the in the chat. Um, do you have, you know, 
I'm sure you're asking yourselves the same question, you know, as you were saying yesterday when we were doing our dry run that this, your practice as a designer, you know, you are as responsible as all of us in upholding these um, graphic, uh, this oppressive aesthetics, if you will, that's how I call them. Um, what, how do you ask yourself this question? How do you respond to it? You're not asking me, are you? Yes, I said. Oh, you are, you are. Can you repeat it? Because I was reading the questions. I thought you were asking. <laughs> okay, okay. I was asking like yesterday when we were together in our uh, practice session and you said, you know, you are as responsible as all of us in upholding these oppressive aesthetics through your work because your clients are asking you to essentially, you know, create something that's going to communicate and that's going to reach people. And um, in a lot of ways, we have to use certain systems that are familiar. And so because they're familiar, they're oppressive at the same time. How do you respond to this question? I know you are asking this, this question daily. I know you have projects on the sides where you have more creative freedom, like, for example, uh, Studio Safar, the magazine and Al Haya magazine and other projects that you're working on. So how do you uh, answer this question? That's a great question, actually. And I'm happy you brought up um, Al Haya because it's, I think, um, a great example of how my uh, background in design has led me to answer topics that are of personal interest to me, um, like uh, women. Um, so another thing that I do that I forgot to mention in the beginning is I have co-founded and I'm the editor-in-chief of a new magazine on the interests, works, and strife of women. It's published in Arabic and in English. Um, and the reason that this was started, I started it with um, For Other Women. And the reason why we started this was because there um, is no publication um, in the region or the world that offers representation to um, women like myself and my partners. Uh, we are all Arab and um, there's no magazine that we felt was representative of that, that talked about issues that are, you know, pretty dark, but, you know, quite happening, um, such as um, sexual harassment um, or, um, or uh, 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 um, uh, economic agency. Uh, when, you, when you gain economic agency from your father, what does that mean? Um, I mean, there, there's, there's the, the, the first issue was just published and there are a lot of interviews with, with, with different women and articles or stories or pieces or opinion pieces written by different women in addition to uh, visual essays. And though, if you look at this project on its own, I mean, this takes up literally half of my time as much as Safa does. But if you were to look at this project and say, I mean, this person studied graphic design, she's a graphic designer by trade and she spends her life, I mean, this is, this is how she makes her bread and butter. This is how she makes her money. She works off of commission design work. This has nothing to do with design, but actually it does. It has a lot to do with design. Um, and if I wasn't, if I didn't start from design, I wouldn't have had it in me um, to start a magazine on women. Um, and that, that's, that's exactly, you know, that's exactly where I'm trying to get at with the question I ask at the end of the deck, um, which is when we're told that we shouldn't be speaking up about politics or, um, or, 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 or climate justice or anything that, you know, that matters to us, um, then we don't, right? And when we realize that actually we should and we do, and being a graphic designer means I actually can talk about these things and I can create a campaign um, that reaches a, a, a very big number of people, um, and, and I do it and it does, then I know that now I'm being, you know, kind of um, not censored, but being kind of like dumbed down in, in, with regards to what I do and what I say. Um, and one of the things is, is, is again, the self-initiated work that I talk about. Another um, important thing that we do at Safad is, um, for example, in light of recent events in the Gulf uh, region, whether it's with Dubai or with Saudi Arabia, um, we've taken the decision to no longer <clears throat> work with um, any artists or, or initiatives that are funded by um, any, any Gulf governments or ministries or anything like that, because um, an art biennial in one country is, you know, created to, to, to wash away, you know, um, like with Expo 2020, I mean, I don't know if, if I can be talking about this now, but what Dubai is doing with Expo 2020 right now is completely washing, you know, the, 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 what's happening politically between the UAE and with Israel. 
Yes, and there has been a lot of backlash. And again, yeah. it's like the use of design as an oppressive tool rather than as a liberatory tool. Absolutely. Uh, in the Middle East, often uh, we are at odds with, with our own liberation, our own freedom for many, in many ways, <laughs> structurally, culturally, through design, through fashion, uh, through the lack of access to land, agriculture. Um, we can go there, that's a whole other class. Um, <laughs> well, let's, let's, let's answer Juliana's question as she's asking, uh, or, or they're asking. In the West, design is understood as something that should be functional and usually used to sell a product. Are there examples or is there a history of Eastern design questioning this always needs to be functional, especially or functional, she goes, perspective of design, like functionality. It seems that you explained about fonts expressed something of this kind, like using fonts and typography. But I think that because from what I understood through your class and other open edu classes on Arab design is that you know, design wasn't a field of practice. It was more around art and illustration and it slowly became a field to, to meet the, the request and the, the, the criteria, let's say, that we have uh, adopted from the West. Uh, so can you elaborate on that? Of course. Um, so it's so. I, what I mean by that is 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 that uh, the field of design is new all over the world. I mean, even even in the West, it's 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 um, it's 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 not a it's not an old mehni. Um, what how do you say mehni in English? Uh, um, um, Métier in French. Uh, it's not a work. Yeah, it's not a it's not it's not an old profession. Profession. It's not an old Career. profession. It's not an old profession, um, and 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 it's even newer in the Arab region. And and so what I was saying about that was not that it was not given its space, but up until we you know got to a time where it was called graphic design as a profession, um, we relied on calligraphers and painters and illustrators to do the work of graphic designers. Um, and um, Juliana, I mean, I'd, I'd love to invite you to also, I mean, I'm not a, an expert at this and, and what I know is what I've shown. I'd, 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 I'd love to invite you to, 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 to tell me also about your findings. I'd love to know more about this and learn more about this and document this and make this accessible. Yes, absolutely. And the Soul Factory would love to host a class around that. But just from our own observation, we can say that there is a lot more openness towards art and art form, design as an art form in the, in the East, um, more around storytelling and less about function. And when it does come around function, there still is a lot of it tied into folklore and into traditions in a lot of ways. And of course, modernism is trying to break that relationship and uh, our fight throughout design and fight is a maybe not the correct word, but our exploration, our research, our interest lies in between connecting the dots with our past, as well as building something that is quote unquote modern because the modernization of our work, our stories, our culture has been uh, a lot, if not all of it influenced by colonial aesthetics and colonial values. And so modernism is, is a topic of discussion, right, in the Middle East? Absolutely. Absolutely. Let's go to Wali Akhter. Uh, the original laws of calligraphy are very tough, and you can't really move away from these laws. So how do you start? Uh, Pakistan is not ready for decolonization of design. Haha, <laughs> they won't let me. <laughs> That's cute. So um, how do you start when you know that there are some laws or some rules within the calligraphic world of Arabic lettering that cannot be broken? The, 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 a big part of, of what I was trying to say basically in the presentation is that there, the, the laws, these law, what we're calling laws and rules have been imposed on us, whether they are grid systems or the ways that we design typography that's based on Latin typography, those are rules. And calligraphy also is no exception to that. Calligraphers have certain rules and conventions and expect people to go by that. If you're to call yourself a calligrapher, you must follow the rules and the conventions. The point I'm trying to make is to break away from these rules. You 
make the rules, right? We all make the rules. This is how we change this. This, um, this is going to become history, right? In the next 100 years, this is what we're doing now is going to become that history and people will talk about this. So what I'm trying to say is change that rules. And if you're saying that Pakistan is not ready for that, well, make it be the first person to start that, you can. <laughs> <laughs> And I, I thought I was muted. <laughs> I was looking for the mute button to come back because I was I, I was taking a note um, that I found here in chat that was very good. That was Joe Pakal saying, I've been recently reading Arturo Escobar and he talks about design for transitions and I was like, oh, I like that. Let me let me look into that. Um, in regards to breaking the rules about design, of course, design is all about constraints, rules, and then once you understand them, then you can allow yourself to breaking them. How, this is not a question that's here. This is more a question from a designer to another. Uh, for instance, at the Slow Factory, you know, we understood the the. The, the constraints, the main constraints that are around communicating really complex ideas to the general public in the most seamless way possible. And our way to breaking the rules of our own decolonial agenda uh, was to use a colonial fund, was to use the most colonial fund ever, and to be like, that's the fund we're using exactly. to talk about that. So that, uh, that, just to say as an example, that was our way of breaking the rules um, but I would love to hear your thoughts on that. And then we move to Nita Verma. Well, we share the exact same thoughts on that. That's why I had mentioned the font <laughs> in the presentation or the calendar is hanging behind me. And not to say that the only way to go about this to decolonize design is to move away from that completely. We cannot move away from that. Use it, make it part of the conversation. Mm -hmm, 100%. Nita Verma says, how do you see pedagogy shift to become more inclusive between global north and global south? Um, I, I think it already is starting to become more inclusive. Um, this conversation has been happening um, for a short period, but it has been happening um, and it's ever increasing. And for me, I mean, I don't know what you think, Celine, but for me, I mean, the only way that, that, that this makes sense to me is the more that we talk about this, the more that it becomes a normal part of our conversation and it stops becoming a kind of like request all the time, please be more inclusive, please be more inclusive. Mm. I mean, we are in constant conversations behind the scenes regarding that. Where is our place to educate others about that type of inclusiveness? And where is our place to instead invite others to say it for us on our behalf? And it's a delicate balance. Um, I mean, we are constantly looking in ways where, uh, and there's a big work of translation between East and West that I, I I think we should talk about, and I know here we have, you know, design as translation is always something we look into at the Slow Factory. I know my colleague Nick is very interested in that as well, but in between East and West, um, that's also something we're deeply interested in uh, exploring. For instance, what you are saying now, you are addressing a crowd that is mostly international. You would have been completely different telling this type of information to uh, a Lebanese crowd or a, a Palestinian crowd or a Palestinian Lebanese and Syrian crowd and Jordanian crowd. Like it would be completely different than now you know you're talking to a, the global majority at large. There are people from all over. So there is a level of translation to these things. For instance, we debated whether or not we were showing certain images because they would be completely misunderstood, taken out of context and used to weaponize us and shut us down, which we've been experiencing a lot uh, in the usage of images from our region, uh, design from our region that's been used as a, as a way to weaponize us. Um, I don't know, few few words on that. What are your thoughts? I mean, th th these are these. This is this is all part of like that, like you know, mind-boggling struggle, right? Um, as practitioners, or as educators, or, or 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 as people just having conversations around this. I mean, what you choose to publish, what you choose to say publicly, is you know has its weight and and its responsibility and all of that. And as you said, what 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 you choose to show or say is also your responsibility in making sure that that doesn't that's not taken. And yet again, um, um, what's the word for something that overtakes something, um, uh, dominated completely yeah. and transformed into a different definition. And so you have to make these unfortunate decisions as well. I mean, there were lots of um, images, what, what Celine is referring to was a lot of images that we wanted to include today, um, sp specifically from the stories from children section that we agreed to in the end remove because um, although they played a very big part in changing the narrative for Arab children um, and showing an alternative representation of the reality of life for Arab children, we decided to remove them um, 
just to make sure that these weren't going to be misinterpreted or reinterpreted um, and, and, and have that become the dominated part of the conversation and we lose the message we're trying to make completely. A hundred percent. And these distractions are important to identify uh, when there is a comment that's distracting from the main topic. Uh, that is also playing in part in dismantling not the oppressive system, but the resistance. So let's be mindful as we are uh, just keeping each other um, accountable. Uh, who are we serving here? What are we trying to, to, up, to uphold and what are we trying to uh, be in solidarity with? Um, an anonymous, uh, sorry, an anonymous attendee <laughs> asked, what is your advice for those already in global north space region and trying to decolonize their own education as design students? Um, I live in Montreal, so I am in, I do I live in the global north. Um, I mean, that's, it's a great question. And, you know, I wish it was like such a clear like checklist, like here, do this and this and this and this and this. Um, but it will be one day. I think it will be one day. I mean, my, 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 my advice for this or, or, or my, my reply to this would be, um, you know, attend talks like these by more people um, from, from, from less, less um, um, uh, spaces that, that are given less representation. Um, Instagram or social media, I mean, I, I don't wanna like promote Instagram, but social media is, is, is a very big space there where people are, are able to take up space to, to, to communicate um, or to share content that isn't, isn't given that much space worldwide otherwise. Um, I don't know. I mean, these things are happening. It's, 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 I mean, I'd love for somebody to also like jump in if you have any, any, any answers or replies to this. I'm, I've also been struggling with this since I moved to Montreal from Beirut, um, feeling like, you know, um, will I have, will I, will, you know, like my imposter syndrome, is this going to grow when I move to the global north because I'm producing work on this from a space that, you know, is, is it not legitimate anymore if I'm doing this from Montreal? It's a great question. I don't know. It's, it's, you know, on my mind a lot. A hundred percent. I mean, some of us are here not by choice, but by, you know, survival. Some of us are here because our entire communities depend on us to succeed in the belly of the beast. So uh, it depends on your relationship with power, I would say. And of course, a list is always what we are asked. Give me the list. Give me what I need to do. And a lot of times it's very hard to compile a list because at the end of the day, it's simplifying and minimizing a lot of experience that is missed out on the list so you check 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 and then where do you where are you within this list basically i would say in our own way we are encouraging a lot of our peers students participants to watch foreign movies uh, old foreign movies with subtitles if you can find them um, there are certain platforms that are easier to find these foreign movies like shasha.com uh, habibi collective potentially um, also on youtube you know like there's if you do a, a quick research on google and find some titles sometimes they are available on youtube and uh, they are subtitled and why I'm suggesting films, because uh, to decolonize, it's also about culture and what better way to, to see the, the, to really understand culture by trying to live it and trying to understand it through the lens of a film or through the lens of a, an independent author or sometimes even, um, you know, minorities within minorities in the region of the global south that are given a camera and, and being able to do all this. So it's very interesting to, to watch, to, to learn more about culture and decolonize our mindset by watching films and movies Absolutely. that are not from America or the United States. Thank you, Dolores, for that note. Uh, hi, Maya. Joe Pakal is asking, thank you so much. I'm working on a speculative design project exploring intersectional design. To what extent do you feel arts movements are deliberate and prescriptive rather than consequential and post explicated? I'm not sure I understood your question, Joe, um, very well. I don't know if you can reply to it. But I did maybe, maybe reply again, Joe, let me see if you wrote again, or maybe just in the chat, I saw you being very active in chat. Oh my God, we have so many questions and some of them are really essays. Um, okay, um, Joe, let's get back. Sorry, haha. <laughs> okay, uh, please help us understand a little bit better your question regarding what you're asking us. So you're working on intersectional design. To what extent do you feel arts movements are deliberate and prescriptive rather than consequential and post explicated? Maybe you have to teach us a little bit to get on your level so we can understand what you mean here. 
uh, use the chat and then we'll get back to you. Uh, yeah. Kate Figgins to Taya is asking, maybe you could tell us about the community you are a part of that is doing this work. Maybe you can tell us a community. Maybe you've, you've shared a lot of people and your yeah. deck. Yeah, so I was just yeah. going to say, Kate, in the deck, you'll see, I'll, I'll source everyone and reference them and you can, you know, you can follow them. It's, it's, it'll, it'll all be there. And also, please join our Slack if you can. Uh, Nicole, just put the link to our Slack here. Uh, if you join our Slack, it will be um, a lot easier for us to share resources. And Maya will work on a list of resources that we will share on Slack and, of course, on email to those of you who are registered. Um, we have a question from Bailey Rose. I deconstruct and reconstruct clothing. And I see at, at as... <laughs> Maybe the sentence is wrong. I see as such a powerful way of decolonizing our clothing. Also, teaching people how to take tags off our clothing to metaphorically rebrand and decolonize our clothing. I could post it online and ask people to Venmo me on a sliding scale to make it accessible to everyone. Yes, Bailey Rose, please do so. And if you are on a Slack, which I think you are, because you are a regular here at the Slow Factor Open EDU, please reach out to us and we would love to support this idea. This sounds great. Let me see here if we have Joe Pakal. Okay, Joe, I'm wondering how much arts movements like international style or classism are actively used to oppress and do that deliberately versus we look at them 50 years later and say, oh, that was classism. And it means this and that. Okay. Um, yeah, I mean, like, the, I think the yeah. answer to the question, Joe. <laughs> absolutely, absolutely. I mean, they are actively used to oppress, and they do do that deliberately, and that will happen fifty years later. Absolutely, it will. And and here at Slow Factory, we are musing on the definition of oppressive aesthetics, which we are trying to work on and define. And I think that. Uh, oppressive aesthetics in one of my classes I dive deeper into it where um, it can be found in the way that you google professional attire for instance and you could see the way that oppressive aesthetics is out there in the world and being imposed and being normalized and educated and socialized as oh this is better and you are less than if you don't look like this and looking like this is this literally looking a certain way which is white and conforming with certain hair types and phenotypes and features features that are deemed professional when others aren't. For example, this is just an example, but there are multiple examples of oppressive aesthetics, including Helvetica and including why behind the scenes we chose to use it. Um, Yara Haidar, thank you Maya for this awesome talk. How about Arabic designers and design educators joining platforms like Domestica that already have a large reach? Yalla, it's coming. I mean, unless I know something, unless you know something about Domestica that's troubling that I don't know of, I think, yes, definitely. Anything that is 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 offering a wide reach, I think should be. Should I be. didn't know that, so I'm taking note. Um, thank you so much. Dorothy Elisa Bowman, do we need also to think about decolonized infrastructures? Example, Photoshop, computers, phones, cameras. Such a great question. Yes, absolutely. That's an amazing question. I mean, look at the, you know, whatever font, you, whatever language you use on your iPhone to, to, to read from, like ch check the font that's being used on the iPhone and why that's, that's there or, you know, I mean, absolutely. It's a great question. Everything, everything. <laughs> Yes, and especially uh, going back to hand drawing and, you know, for instance, even handwriting, sometimes we, we are exploring that as well at the Slow Factory. Mm -hmm. Highly Human uh, wrote, hi, Celine and Maya. I don't know if you're highly human from Instagram, but if you are, hello. Uh, thank you for today. I'm not sure if you both are connected with Antionette Carroll of Con uh, CRX Lab, of course, and she has a class on, on Slow Factory Open Education, but I can see you all collaborating. I totally agree. They are an, an organization rallying an intergenerational movement of redesigners for justice. 100%. Let's put that link in here. If y'all don't know them, please check them out. And yes, you did hear me say y'all. I've been practicing very much about this one. I can't say you guys anymore. Um, okay, so here you guys are. <laughs> Creative Reaction Lab and Antionet Carol has a class on the Slow Factory platform. And I believe here Nicole posted it. It's equity-centered community design. And it's an incredible class. And yes, we are uh, looking for more collaborations with uh, the CRX lab. 
that Internet Carol started and uh, stay tuned. We don't have anything in the books just yet, but we are deeply interested and are big fans of, 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 of all of their work. Tai Nhu, um, sorry if I didn't pronounce your name correctly, Tai Nhu. It is also development of print media, which made it, which made it the typography going west. Convenience is also part which lead to colonization of design. Let be architecture and print. I don't understand the question, but Maya, if you, if yeah. you. I think I understood the question. Um, um, the question is, I think more in relation to when it becomes more convenient for us to get, you know, um, print material out, um, that probably impacts why we use fonts that look like Latin fonts versus take a step back and adapt. Um, your, 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 your question is great and, and I agree with you and of course, and that's why I said it's important to, to, to not erase that part completely or say that we are complicit in a bad way uh, in perpetuating this conversation or, or in perpetuating the narrative on colonized design. But it's also very important to just take a step back and realize this and acknowledge this and understand this. And like Celine said earlier, either make this be part of the conversation because then you're owning up to it and you're changing that by owning up to it um, or decide you don't want to be part of it and change that. Um, but I agree with you absolutely in print and in architecture and in all of that. A hundred percent. And I just realized I was chatting only to the hosts. And, uh, <laughs> so I'm just going to paste again the, the, ah, no, that's not the right one. Anyway, team, can you help me uh, post the link to a uh, uh, CRX lab, please? Uh, I, I have it somewhere here. I don't know where it went. But anyway, just to share with everybody out oh, here, Creative Reaction Lab, CRX, Creative Reaction Lab, there it is. Okay, great. Now we are chatting with everybody. So um, thank you, Paloma. Laura, would love to buy Journal Safat. Where is it available? So our website is currently down. I'm not sure why, I'll look into it. But you can go on stackmagazines.com and you can find, um, I think, two issues there. Nada, please, if you can, put your question inside the, the, the q and uh, I'm sure it sounds a great question, um, asking for tips. Uh, Ingrid, hi, Maya. With all the influence we have grown up with from America and Europe, how can we begin to decolonize our own design style? What a great question. Um, great question, Ingrid. Thanks, thanks for asking that. Um, what, one of the things to do is to um, take a look at all the initiatives that you posted about today um, and learn about the history of, I don't know where you come from, but try to learn, if, 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 it, if made accessible, try to learn about um, the design history um, that, you, that you come from, knowing that American and European um, influence was part of that history. Okay, I'm going to Saba's question. Thank you, Saba Sader, for, for giving me a wasta. You have a wasta with me, yalla. Because there are so many questions and we're gonna run out of time. And Saba said, please read my question. Saba Sader, I'm not a designer, but as someone who often writes, researches and, or brainstorms for shared collective goals, design is an effective tool in communication. I am a co-founder of an informal collective, Nehna Hon, a feminist anti-racist co-op based in Beirut, yet to spread, the, uh, to spread to other parts of Lebanon that currently run a daycare center for single immigrant mothers, primarily those who immigrated via Kafala system and act as a resource center for calls. Currently we are on Instagram. We often discuss the language barrier we have as not everyone reads Arabic or English in Lebanon. One idea we had is including voice recordings on the captions to resolve this or present clear visuals such as infographics. We are certainly not the only collective gearing for alternative economies or care economy towards immigrants. So we also wish to merge networks both locally and transnationally. The need to use a different medium such as sound or visuals is included in this challenge. All feedback is welcome. Thank you. Thank you, Saba. I'm going to um, find ways to reach out to you. Uh, if you can, uh, I don't know, share your email just with me or with our team. Uh, we would love to support. Uh, um, also, thank you, Saba. Also, I'm, I would say uh, for someone like me who is an illiterate in Arabic, I don't know how to read and write. I was uh, taken away from my country, uprooted so young. And when I came back, I was a rebel. I did not want to read or write or learn. 
<laughs> but I love the Arabish and I can def I speak Arabic and I love Arabish, which is basically writing Arabic in English letters. And um, that helps. And I find my weakness and my disability in learning my own language also helping me in what we just talked about translation and design or reaching everybody in design, working on access and accessibility. So um, think, okay, I, I got your email, sorry. And um, definitely uh, I'm gonna, I'm going to write it down because I can't copy paste somehow, but um, I'm going to to reach out. And Maya, do you have anything to add to that? Um, just very quickly. I mean, first, hi, Sabah. How are you? <laughs> um, I'm, I'm, I'm very happy to read about the initiative. Um, I didn't know at all anything about that. Um, and I will also I, I'll also reach out to you um, but later. But I, what I wanted to say is it's a great question um, because a lot of the initiatives or the work that we do out of the region usually is meant to target people from the region. And we forget that people from the region are also um, 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 migrant domestic workers. Um, and, and that means that they don't read and speak Arabic. And, and that's why, for example, with Al Hayya, we, in the beginning it was an Arab woman's magazine, or Arab woman was, was used in the description that we quickly, quickly removed because first, um, Ethiopian women um, that, that, are from, that live in the, from the region, for me, are considered from the region for 100,000%. Um, and of course, other than that, the fact that um, North American um, people don't identify as Arabs, like some Egyptians and Moroccans and, and Algerians and whatnot. Um, but I would say, ask them, make them part of the conversation around that or make them part of the solution. Uh, and is it Sabah? Sorry, I did not know. Sabah, okay. Okay, let's go on. We have 10 more minutes. There's millions of other questions. <laughs> Maya, do you want to go and like select one of them so that uh, it's not just me going chronologically? Yeah. Sure, I'm just gonna scroll. I'm Except sorry. for Saba, who, who, who gave me a little wasta on the side, so I went for it. Please read my question, Habiba. Okay, okay. <laughs> Go ahead. Where are you, Habiba? I can't see you. That's all anonymous, anonymous, anonymous. Um, I'm gonna... ah, Habiba. Hi, Maya. I'm working on my bachelor project on Arab women asserting their influence in the Arab art world. To what extent do you think it affects Arab women's attitude and way of thinking? Sorry, can you repeat the question, Sidin? I can't find yes. it. Yes, yes, okay. Uh, hi, Maya. I'm working on my bachelor project on Arab women asserting their influence in the Arab art world. To what extent do you think it affects Arab women's attitude and way of thinking? To what extent what? Design? Um, I, I think to what extent does, does, does their practice is affect their, is that, does, did I get the question right? I mean, yeah, maybe. Um, it certainly does um, because when you, um, I mean, when, 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 when there is content you know, published about that, um, it kind of acknowledges and validates the space that, that is being literally occupied in your research um, paper um, or in your thesis, or I'm sorry, I forgot what it is that you're working on, but it occupies literal space in that, um, in that creative mm -hmm. representation. And so it, it of course does. Sorry, I'm trying to answer really fast. I know, and now we only have 10 minutes. Um, maybe what we can do is, uh, uh, team, if we can just collect these questions as we do in every open edu class we'll send them back to you and then in your own time you can answer them and then include them as part of your resource list and then of course if you are on slack uh, we'll share that there first and then you'll receive an email for those of you who are only registered via the email uh, a few last words maya like based on everything you've shared i know this is a topic that you are both interested in as well as researching in so it's not like you're coming in as i know it all and you you, you did mention that and I, I appreciated that and so so do i like i'm interested in all this as well as researching it constantly trial and error so uh, any last words of uh, uh, wisdom of advice that you can leave our uh, audience with um, I mean, first, support, attend, and 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 you know, make more uh, initiatives like the one that we're doing today. These are so important. Their existence is, you know, them them this being free is so important. This is such important work that's happening. Um, but as designers, I mean, advice as designers. Um, I think one of one of one of the, the the most important pieces of advice I would I would give is. Um, please become a very good writer. Like if you're a designer and, and you're told you don't need to learn how to write. A hundred percent. Thank you for saying that. That is so true. 
Yes, become a good writer. That's all I have to say. It's so funny because I, we, when we are hiring for design, we always say information design or someone who works with information, who writes and designs. And, you know, a lot of times, uh, you know, it's hard to find, first of all, um, someone who does that. It's like a gem when you do. And, um, and a lot of times designers are like, well, but I have other qualities. I do other types of design or I do illustration and so on and so forth. And now I think that designers are faced with even more of a responsibility to be more uh, generalists, if you will, so that you can translate because the work of a designer is very much the work of a translator to understand culture, to translate it back to the public, to understand the machine. If you are a UX designer, translating it back to, um, Absolutely. end user etc cetera, etc cetera. and so um especially when you work across cultures like like us you have to be able to to have this quality of of being a good writer or at least at least having the interest of writing or researching or um definitely one last question that caught my eye what are barriers or limitations that you faced maya meaning what barriers limit this kind of authentically democratized decolonial design work. I'm a non-designer, but work in an art museum, so I'm adjacent. Curious to hear more about your thoughts about other barriers, seen and unseen. And I think this is Ilk Yasha. I don't know if I pronounced your name correctly, but your question is amazing. It's an amazing question. Um, actually, I'm gonna I'm gonna refer, I'm gonna answer this by referring to a question somebody else asked, Tom Takigayama, um, and Tom asks, I so appreciate the work put into the surface, uh, into surface the root sources. How do you approach the line between inspiration and appropriation? And my answer to you is that um, my first language growing up was not Arabic; it was English, and I went to an American high school and an American university, um, and so Arabic was spoken. It was my first language, but reading and writing. It wasn't. It was something I learned as an adult, um, and the 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 the, um, the fraud that I grew up, you know, feeling when I was applying this into my work. Um, one of the barriers was was that was that line between inspiration and appropriation. Um, if I didn't grow up reading and writing Arabic, then am I appropriating that as an adult? Am I use it in my work? Um, I think that's that's what I would answer with if I were to pick one. And Tom, I don't know. <laughs> I, th I don't know. It's a it's a conversation, and it's a brilliant question, and it's a question I ask myself, um, and my partner and I talk about all the time. Um, I don't know, but it's I do know that the one way to approach this this fine line between inspiration and appropriation is to have a conversation about it. A hundred percent, and that is why this space is so sacred for us. Open EU is a place of conversation, and uh, it's a place of uh, documenting and um, and codifying certain educations that were not provided to us in mainstream education, educational institutions, whether abroad or here in the global north. Um, so please, if you find this interesting, do consider supporting Open EDU. Open EDU is free, accessible education for all, and we do survive thanks to the generous donations we receive, monthly donations or one-off donations, and we do support our instructors and in providing them uh, an honorarium that is way above market for teaching us and helping us build this curriculum for all. So please, if you love what we do, consider donating. A monthly donation goes a long way. Uh, we are so grateful for you. We have been um, able to run and to go this far with all of your support. And now because of our activism with Palestine, and I mean, not now, we've always done that, but now more and more because it has uh, really through design and our work, we've we've um, really reached a bigger audience than ever before. And so now our work is being stigmatized and targeted um, and support is, uh, is, is everything we need, especially from our public so we can remain unapologetic into what we say and what we do and what we teach within the Slow Factory uh, curriculum and institutions. So please consider donating if you love what we do to keep us alive. Thank you so much, Maya. Thank you all. And thank you, Antonio. Thank you, Jenny, our interpreters. We are so grateful for you. Thank you. Um, <laughs> thank you, um, Nick, for organizing this. Uh, thank you, Paloma, Nicole, Krista, Zoya, for helping us behind the scenes, supporting us. And thank you to each and every one of you. Uh, please stay in touch. Uh, there's a class on Friday with Mandy Harris-Williams. 
who is Ideal Black Female on Instagram. If you follow, she's incredible. They are going to give us the most amazing class, I'm sure. Please join us. And thank you again so much, Maya. I know you just landed from Lebanon and I am yeah. so grateful for you. You did um, amazing. I'd love, to, I'd love to answer all of the questions um, when I have a moment and I can do that through my Instagram account if you guys share all the questions with me. Um, I'll Thank answer you. everyone's questions on Instagram, so. And do please follow Maya Mumne on Instagram, just like it's pronounced. I'm going to leave it here, Maya Mumne, with H, no? Yeah, without an H, so it's M-A-Y-A-M-O-U-M-N-E. M-N-E without the H, okay. Forget the first one and use this one. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much, Maya. It's been me. amazing. Thank you so much, Antonio and Jenny. We are so grateful for you. And um, thank you, everyone. We'll, we'll keep the questions uh, rolling and then we'll get back to you all. Bye, Maya. Thank you. Have a bye. beautiful afternoon. Thank you so much. Thank you, everyone from Slow Factory. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye.